senior fellow here at the New America Foundation, and uh, welcome you all today. And um, you know, I guess uh, one way to start is uh, there's this document which has always fascinated me, which was a, a article that came out 37 years ago. It was written by Milton Friedman and uh, published in the New York Times Sunday Magazine. It was called The Social Responsibility of Business is to Increase Its Profits. And, um, you know, I came across that and read It's really, you know, just a series of assertions. Um, and it sort of fits in with his general take on, on, on what's the purpose of a corporation, what's the purpose of business. You know, and he said much the same thing about trade. The purpose of trade is just to get things that are more cheaply. Um, the reason I start with this is really, you know, two reasons is, uh, First is just to kind of emphasize how long this debate about what's the purpose, what you can get out of the corporation, what you can get out of trade in terms of human rights, in terms of you know, social advance, has been going on. Because when Milton Friedman wrote that article 37 years ago, he was referring and responding to a lot of dialogue that had been going on in the 1960s, which itself was shaped by a lot of dialogue that had gone on in the late 50s. And in fact, in my own research, I found that this, in the U.S. experience, this goes back to the late 18th century when there were debates about where we should get our sugar from uh, and, and its effect on what, what were we supporting, you know, uh, British slavery in the uh, Caribbean. The um, other reason I, I mention this is just because it's, you know, just sort of to show how sort of extreme the prevailing ideology is because, I mean, the, the sense that the corporations really exist just to make money, I mean, that's really been, even though it doesn't have any basis in fact, it doesn't have any basis in law, uh, it's really what make people have come to believe in this country since that article was written. And that's what will bring me to this book, which is why we're here today. And what I like about this book, what I think it's important, is because, precisely because it provides such a balanced look at this issue. You know, rather than sort of, you know, going to the opposite extreme from where Milton Friedman dragged us a long time ago, it sort of, you know, starts off with the idea that there is no black and white on this issue. In fact, there's not even, there's actually very little that we actually know about this, about the link between trade policy and human rights. I think it's also important, the other reason that this book is important is because of the timeliness of it. I mean, right now, there's these votes that are coming up on these free trade agreements with Korea, with Peru, Panama. You know, the Democratic leadership, it looks like they're going to push the Peru agreement because they say it's going to be a way to ratchet up protections for environment, for labor, for human rights. So it's timely in that sense. It's also timely, though, because one of the things is that Americans, we've really come to sort of see ourselves as sort of the people who are kind of the, pulling all the levers in the world, and that we're the ones who make the decision about, you know, using our trade policy, our purchasing, that we can sort of decide who's, you know, what kind of human rights environment exists in China, what kind of human rights environment exists in, in Kenya. And the world has changed so dramatically in the last 15 years in terms of who's providing what where that increasingly the question is, if there is a connection between trade and human rights, the levers may not be being pulled in this country anymore. And the downward, whatever, whatever is being degraded, it may well be being degraded in this country. So anyway, um, the people who wrote this book, um, Susan Aronson, she's a professor at the Graduate School of Business and at the Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University. She's written about six books, and um, or I guess five in addition to this one. Uh, one of which was a high school primer on trade and globalization. Uh, I guess she'd also spent a while as a, as a journalist of sorts back in the 1990s, spent a lot of time as a commentator for All Things Considered, for Marketplace, uh, for Morning Edition. 
And then we also have uh, Jamie Zimmerman, who I know here from New America, and uh, she's the Associate Director of the Global Assets Program, and which is part of the Asset Building Program here at New America. And uh, well, I guess you know one of the things I just learned about Jamie is that she spent some of her time um, living abroad and sort of dealing with these issues face to face. She lived in uh, Brazil for a while, she lived in uh, Peru for a while, up in uh, near Cusco. So uh, anyway, I think this is be interesting, and I'm uh, glad you all are here with us today. Hi, and thanks for coming. Few of us could look at the pictures coming from Myanmar this week, or Darfur or Zimbabwe in recent months, and, and not feel the urge to do something. Although President Bush is no human rights advocate, he somehow felt that urge, and or maybe his wife made him feel that urge because she's made Myanmar her issue. And so last week he, he announced targeted sanctions that he would put on top of the already existing trade and investment sanctions enacted by the US government. But I had to wonder as he did this, did he really think about whether or not doing something would do anything good at all for the very people of Darfur? Did he ask, was trade the best tool to promote human rights, and what human rights and whose human rights might be affected by these new sanctions? So in 2003 and 2004, Jamie and I began to ask these questions together, and we were very lucky to con the Levi Strauss Foundation into funding us to come up with a research plan for that work, and then we got some more money to actually do the work. Um, and we found that trade and human rights are frequently out of balance, although that wasn't the original title of the book, Trade and Balance. It was originally called Writing Trade. There are many reasons why policymakers struggle to achieve both of these very broad policy goals. First, there has been very little research on how trade and human rights are connected and how trade policy may affect human rights and how human rights policies may affect trade. Scholars are just beginning to study this and they don't know if trade enhances some rights or undermines others and how these relationships change over time. So we're all walking into this intersection quite blind. Secondly, each nation has human rights, different human rights conditions, objectives and policies and these change over time reflecting demographics, culture, politics, economics. Third, trade policies are increasingly complex. Remember, last year GAO said the United States participates in more than 400 trade agreements. How could they possibly keep track of all of them? And finally, we found most governments have not developed channels to coordinate human rights. So what Jamie and I'd like to do today is discuss how we can help policymakers find a new equilibrium, building on the findings and recommendations in our book. All right, I don't, I don't think this is on. So can everybody hear me? Every, oh, it, it is working? OK, great. All right, perfect. All right, well, welcome, everyone. Um, thanks, Susan, for the, the introduction to the issue. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, out to support the book launch today. It's really great to see some familiar faces in the room. Well, most of you, though, I think are new faces, so that's exciting, too. Um, I first want to thank New America Foundation, in particular the Foreign Policy Program for hosting the event, but also uh, Ray Bouchara, the director of the Asset Building Program and the Global Assets Project, for which I work, for encouraging and supporting uh, us doing this event here at New America Foundation. Uh, and thanks to all of you in the room who've worked with us, advised us, asked us tough questions throughout the writing process, and for all your support along the way. And finally, thanks to Susan Aronson for providing me the exciting opportunity to develop research, travel all over the world and write this book with her. Um, I wanted to start today um, with an email that I received this morning from one of the advisory committee members that we had for this book, Anthony Hill. He's the former ambassador of Jamaica to uh, GATT WTO in the UN and he writes to me and says uh, dear Jamie can't come today but congratulations on bringing these issues together in such a compelling way while timely 
They always seem to be just a little late in shaping the outcome of negotiations decisively. Note the about to abruptly conclude EU ACP regional EPAs, and uh, that's the economic partnership agreement uh, between EU and uh, African, Caribbean, and Pacific countries. Uh, and note that despite w that the WTO, despite the early start on your topic, still feels confident to headline its WTO Public Forum 2007, how can the WTO help to harness globalization while making overtures to environment, governance, et cetera, but with no central place for your topic? This email and uh, the emails like them that we receive signal to us that we are reaching a tipping point on this issue that despite concerted efforts on the part of many nations to keep human rights and trade in separate boxes, especially at the WTO, that this, and that in this ever-globalizing world, policymakers can no longer ignore how these two issue areas interact, or ignore the all too often intrinsic overlap between them, or ignore the goals for or commitments to one while pursuing the other. So the purpose of our book and our research is to shed light onto the fact that there are myriad ways human rights and trade are already interacting. What we sought to do is leave the theory and legal debates behind, because those have been long, long debated topic of human rights and trade, international trade lawyers and legal scholars. What we wanted to do is look at what is really happening on the ground, the reality that policymakers face in their countries in real time. So to that end, we sought to find the answer to what I consider four central questions, though we asked many more questions than this throughout the book and attempted to answer them. But one, how is the relationship between human rights and trade perceived, particularly by policymakers, but also by business, by NGOs, by labor leaders, by the think tanks, by academia? How do these perceptions differ for countries at different stages of development or political and economic power? More importantly, how have policymakers and these other actors behaved in response to these perceived conflicts between their trade and human rights objectives? And what do these behaviors teach us, if anything, about how policymakers can bring coherence and balance to these two extremely important policy objective areas? In the next couple minutes, what I'm hoping to do is give you a glimpse into how we went about uh, finding the answer to these questions and writing this book and uh, giving you a glimpse into some of the different issue areas we covered in the different case study chapters that we wrote. And then I'll turn it over to Susan, who will then discuss some the overall findings of the book, and if she has time, hopefully go into some of our recommendations for how to bring these two into greater balance. So the first, the, for, on the methodology, the first thing we did to answer these four questions was form an advisory committee of top human rights, trade, and legal scholars, uh, policymakers, labor leaders, business executives, NGO groups, anybody we could think of who's been working in this area for a long time. And we qu quickly decided to focus our research on a series of qualitative case studies as opposed to empirical data analysis, predominantly because of our desire to understand and tell the story of behavior at the intersection of trade and human rights. And one of the first questions our advisory committee members who were from all over the world in all different disciplines asked us is, well, what human rights are you talking about? <laughs> and we realized that different countries have different human rights priorities and commitments, and that the list of human rights and covenants at the UN that hold them seem actually endless. The Universal Declaration on Human Rights, covenants for everything, sub-covenants for those. And so for simplicity and consistency purposes, we decided only to evaluate issues pertaining to the 30 rights within the UN. Universal Declaration on Human Rights, as, the, as that is the only single human rights document that all of our case study countries have signed and ratified. And there's a list of those in the handout that was uh, outside on the table. I'm not if everybody was able to pick that up. So what we did was we evalu evaluated four case study countries, South Africa, Brazil, the European Union, and the United States, as well as the WTO. And many people ask us why we chose the countries we did. What we wanted to do here was have a sample of countries that were diverse enough politically, economically, and socially, had different commitments to human rights, viewed human rights in different ways, but were also all at the same time trade powerhouses, all major players in the trade, international trade field. Moreover, each of the case studies, oh, I already said that. Thus. Our research agenda consisted of substantial background research to understand the human rights histories and development of trade and investment policies in each of these countries and in the WTO, 
And while that laid the groundwork to understand perceptions and actions at the intersection of trade and human rights, it was the second phase of the research which I believe gave us the more telling and compelling information for this book. For each of these case studies, we completed dozens and dozens of interviews with trade policymakers, with the human rights commissions, with human rights and constitutional lawyers, with business executives, labor leaders, think tanks, NGO, NGOs, the list of everybody that we interviewed throughout the process is actually in the back of the book. And we wanted them to tell us their stories of how they perceive the linkages between trade and human rights and what they have done and what they think should have been done or should be done in order to influence that relationship. Their stories range from a particular trade policy affecting a particular human rights priority or vice versa to how trade policy has been used to prod human rights improvements around the world to, the, to how the very process of trade policy making can be considered either human rights undermining or human rights enhancing, depending on who you talk to. From those interviews, we chose between four and six issue areas for each case study country to put a spotlight on the complexities of the relationship between trade and human rights. These don't represent all or even the most pressing necessarily of the issues we learned about in our interviews, but we chose what we felt were the most interesting, the most diverse, looking at the range of issues, issue areas to best demonstrate how this issue affects many levels and layers of policy making all over the world. So that's our methodology and now I just wanted to give a quick glimpse into some of the stories that we told within the different uh, chapters of the book. Each chapter tells a different story of the different case study country um, as opposed to comparative issue areas. Um, it, I'm not going to give you the inclusive list of everything that we wrote. I just wanted to highlight a couple uh, interesting pieces of each chapter. Also in the handout there is a list of all the different human rights uh, that we discussed in each chapter and the particular trade policy or strategy um, that's connected to those and uh, so I encourage you to look at those and ask any questions about ones that I don't discuss uh, during the Q&A. So the first chapter is about the WTO at the WTO level, where the discussion of human rights and other non-trade concerns has traditionally been taboo, we highlighted numerous ways human rights concerns are seeping into the system, such as the rule of law language in the China accession to agreements to consider food security or the right to food as part of agricultural negotiations, to trade waivers on human rights concerns, and discussion of services negotiations, and to amending trade rules to allow members to protect their citizens' right to health. And we foresee this list growing and growing into the future. The next chapter is on South Africa. In South Africa, we tell the story of how this small developing nation with its own colorful human rights history uh, views trade not only as a necessary means to economically empower its citizens, but while doing so, keeping its extremely progressive commitment to realizing the human rights of all of the people within their country. It has indeed had a powerful impact on the trade and human rights balance, especially for the small nation that it is and for the big players that it comes up against um, at the WTO and in trade negotiations. For instance, it led efforts at the WTO to clarify and amend the TRIPS agreement to ensure that governments can import and or produce drugs needed by its citizens in times of health emergencies. It also led efforts to prevent atrocious human rights abuses in the production of diamonds, which is important in South Africa, through the Kimberley process, which is the very first ever waiver of WTO obligations based on human rights grounds. In Brazil, we discovered how a middle-income developing country can be a trade powerhouse and be especially effective at using trade to accomplish certain human rights goals, but not always acting consistently when doing so. For instance, very recently, Brazil boldly used Article 20, banning trade on the grounds of moral or public protection, to justify its ban on importing retreaded tires, particularly from the EU but around the world, claiming a threat to the public health of its people and the environmental hygiene of the country. Though not without complica complications, the WTO favored largely on the side of Brazil. And this was seen recently as groundbreaking, and this happened actually after the book was written, so that's new news that's largely on in the book. Uh, and Brazil is also leading efforts to clarify the relationship between indigenous rights and intellectual property, as defined in the Convention on Biodiversity and trade rules around intellectual property. However, when it comes to labor issues, 
Brazil tells a whole different story. It's very reluctant to approach the WTO on these issues, like most developing nations are. This has been a fight um, that the North and the South, or the, the West and the South, have been fighting a long time. Uh, in the case of child labor, however, the Brazilian government has been successful in skirting the WTO uh, by addressing labor issues uh, with its business leaders and its NGOs on a number of fronts. For example, Brazil has successfully developed an anti-child labor program, which includes a child-friendly social seal called the Abrinki symbol uh, on its products, and, and that has seemed in many ways to appease uh, some of the uh, critics of its labor conditions uh, that would like to see these discussed at the WTO level. Within the EU, we found, we found that the European Union, which we looked at as a, as a whole, not as e at, w at each country within the, each of the 25 countries in the EU specifically, but looked at it as an entire system, we found that it uh, has both progressive and ironic behavior at the intersection of trade and human rights. On the one hand, the EU is the, only, is the one and only case study country that we looked at, and I think the only in the world, that uses human rights clauses in its bilateral trade agreements to provide incentives for its trade partners to adhere to human rights conventions. The EU has also led efforts to define rules around the trade of cu cultural property by heralding the UN Convention on the Protection and Promotion of Cultural Expression. However, policymakers and others interviewed in the EU frequently cited the EU's own trade policy making process as undermining the right to political participation and freedom of in information of its people within its own borders. And we won't even discuss the uh, EU's agricultural policy and how uh, that is perceived by many abroad. In the United States, basically we consider the U.S. an outlier um, in many ways. More than any other country, the U.S. is willing and frequently does use a wide range of trade policies, both carrots and sticks, to promote human rights abroad. For instance, through its trade promotion authority by using trade to prod other governments to regulate in a transparent manner that encourages involvement and feedback from the public, the U.S. argues that it enhances its trade partner citizens' right to political participation and administrative due process rights. The U.S. uses the law of bilateral trade agreements and the power of its trade policy reviews to actively press its trade partners to protect labor rights in order to begin or continue trade relationships. And of all countries, the U.S. seems by far the most willing to impose trade sanctions in order to change another country's human rights behavior. Uh, for better, for worse, whether. And out of all the case study countries, however, the U.S. is the least active in using trade policy to protect human rights at home. Uh, at least it doesn't speak about it it's in the rhetorical sense that you would expect in the way that it is spoken about um, in our other case study countries. So while that gives you a mini glimpse of some of the issues discussed in the chapters, we typically uh, have four or six different stories that we tell, all of them looking at a different human rights issue, uh, a different trade policy or strategy used to address them. So I encourage you to, uh, to ask questions about these or any of the others that are in the handouts that we give you during the Q&A, but I didn't want to exhaust all the time going through them now. So I'll turn it over to Susan, who's going to discuss our overall findings and uh, hopefully some recommendations. Yeah, I'm going to try to get through this in 10 minutes because we really want to hear Owen's comments and then make sure that you have time for questions. So, so I'm going to sort of do my New York shtick, which is to speak very quickly. Uh, but if I'm not clear, someone stop me, please. Okay. In most countries, policymakers develop trade policies as if they're strictly commercial policies. They weigh the interests of their producers and consumers. They may include national security or political concerns but they rarely introduce the interests of the global community into that deliberation. Nor do they admit that trade agreements are the key policy tool to regulate globalization. As a result, although policymakers are well aware of the human rights consequences of their decision, they have very few incentives to ensure that trade policies advance the particular, third, let's say, the 30 human rights outlined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, the right to food provides a good example of it, and it may explain why the ag negotiations to some extent are really bedeviled. No country is explicitly tasked to develop trade compromises that promote the right to food of all the world's people. 
policymakers develop their trade positions based on the interests of their ag producers and consumers. We're not saying they shouldn't. We're just making this finding. And maybe, you know, well, we can talk about the recommendations later. Second finding, many people believe that the WTO forces members to choose between trade rules and objectives and human rights rules and objectives. As a result, they claim the WTO directly undermines human rights. But the WTO rules make no explicit mention of human rights, and neither the WTO nor the GATT. This is not true of the ITO, but anyway, it wasn't intended to address human rights. What the WTO do, does is set limits on how and when policymakers can use trade policy to promote human rights. Now, what does that mean? Okay, within strictures, Countries have considerable flexibility under WTO rules to protect human rights at home or abroad. For example, they can use trade waivers and exceptions. They occasionally bring up human rights during accessions and trade policy reviews. It was a huge issue during the NTR China debate. But we definitely need further guidance from the members of the WTO as well as the dispute settlement body on the relationship between international trade law and human rights law. Interestingly enough, we found that WTO membership may have some interesting side effects on the promotion of particular human rights. And I don't know if you all are familiar with the work of Danny Roderick at Harvard, but he had a thesis that, you know, trade teaches the habits of good governance, and that habit may spill over into the polity as a whole. And so we sort of tested that. For example, to comply with WTO rules, all members must regulate in a transparent, accountable manner and provide citizens and traders the opportunity to influence and participate in certain aspects of policy making. So did these habits of good governance spill over? Well, we looked at human rights performance and, and it's starting to look in that direction, but it, we suggest that other scholars need to do more sophisticated and further research in this regard. And we can talk about this further in the questions. Third finding, every country we visited is concerned about labor rights. They don't know how to create new jobs and maintain high labor standards. And South Africa was the perfect example of that. Services trade liberalization, we found, can enhance human rights by providing more people with affordable and reliable access to services such as credit, water, health, electricity, and education. But, but this is a problem of governance. If national governments do not effectively regulate the provisions of these services, it may be human rights undermining. In other words, some of their citizens may not benefit. Okay, there's no one right way to ensure that trade doesn't undermine policymakers' ability to help their citizens realize particular human rights, nor is there one way to, to use trade to advance human rights abroad. The United States and the EU have very contrasting approaches. The EU talk, 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 but they try to promote all human rights because they really believe that human rights are indivisible and universal. The United States doesn't do that at all. In the United States, oh, and the EU rarely suspends trade concessions, and when they use sanctions, they're very targeted on the rulers, okay? We've learned from the EU. We also try to target uh, our sanctions now, but we only care about particular human rights. And we care about labor rights, as Jamie said, and we care about political rights to a great extent. Six, different approaches to linking trade and human rights, and you know, we, we knew this when we started, reflect a wide range of political, social, economic, and cultural factors. Richer societies are more likely to contest human rights abuses abroad. They're also more likely to contest human rights abuses regarding the human rights they value. But in truth, we didn't find they were any more likely to weigh the human rights impact on their own people. Seven, the trade policy making process. The process may undermine human rights. Many countries have not developed a trade policy making process that is open, transparent, and accountable to all of their citizens. In general, and this is the most boring part of almost every chapter of the book, we looked at how they made trade policy and whether or not human rights entered the equation. And as a result of looking at that, we saw gee, who could influence the trade policy making process? Who, who could comment and who did policymakers listen to? And in most countries, it was a very small circle of people. Okay, 
Eighth finding, the United States frequently acts on its own to promote particular human rights. So as Jamie said, the United States is a total outlier here. Congress has its own trade and human rights agenda, which can include acting on human rights issues without the involvement of the executive. Now, um, what are some of the things the United States does? Um, for example, I don't know if you're familiar with Max Baucus pressed that in every bilateral trade agreement, the country that has this bilateral trade agreement with the United States, they must have a trade policy making process that says this is what we're proposing to do. You have the opportunity to comment on it. Um, there are 60 days of comments. The individuals can challenge the trade agreement. So the United States, using the desire to trade, the United States uses the leverage of its own market to promote, promote democracy abroad. And whether you or not you think that's a good idea, the United States does it. And I think it has a huge impact on democracy. If you believe, a la Roderick, that this spills over into the polity, it could be a very good thing, even though it uses bullying to do that. So I, I was surprised by my own response to this. Okay, um, so let me just briefly discuss our nine recommendations. They are, first, we think governments should think about this. Policymakers should decide that trade and human rights should be coordinated. They should think about what human rights impact, is, and well, looking at all those 30 human rights, because they have an obligation to advance those human rights. So they should at least think about it. That's number one. Number two, they should develop a channel for human rights concerns to enter the policymaking process. They should set up an advisory system that allows human rights policymakers and advocates in decision making. Third, they should task advisors to ask the right questions when making policy decisions, such as how will this trade agreement affect the most vulnerable, whether it's in the Dominican Republic or the most vulnerable people in Louisiana? How will it affect policymakers' ability to invest in or supply things like credit, education, infrastructure, social safety nets? Will this create more or fewer opportunities for participation in national and global governance? Okay, to use a, a Bush administration cliche, the United States should create a coalition of the willing at the WTO. Set up a working group to examine these questions. Only one net member needs to request it. But the staff should start to look at these questions. Encourage business to make human rights a business priority. We can talk about that a little bit more, because that's really not trade per se. It's how the participants in trade behave. Um, clarify relationships. For example, how can you use procurement policies to advance human rights? Is this a distortion of trade? Um, encourage and disseminate research. This is not the be all end all on this issue. We're hoping that other scholars will start to look at it. Uh, explore the human rights impact assessment. More and more governments are starting to do this, and in this regard I cite the Danish government. The Swedish government requires that all of its public policies not undermine the Millennium Development Goals. I think that's interesting. So policymakers have a mandate to weigh these questions. And finally, this is not, this is Lael Brainerd's recommendation, so I'm free riding on it, but in any case, she talked about, in a book that she wrote about um, remaking U.S. foreign assistance, she talked about why don't the EU and the United States cooperate? We have the same goals, and labor rights would be a good example. Human rights is another one. Our foreign assistance is branded. We want to get the benefits of our foreign assistance. But if we work together, we could actually achieve those goals that we say that we want and perhaps save taxpayers some money. If we share these goals, why can't we collaborate? So. Okay, so in conclusion, people are the principal wealth of nations. We believe the countries that protect and promote human rights are those countries that will achieve, over time, sustainable economic development. For, for many reasons, policymakers that weigh human rights as they develop trade policy are likely to ensure that their constituents prosper at the intersection of trade and human rights. Okay, sorry about that quick dance, Owen. Sure. Um, Susan and Jamie have talked a bit about the international um, context, indeed the proposal that uh, the U.S. and EU should consider collaborating um, when developing uh, the role of human rights and trade policy has, has already, I know, 
provoked, uh, provoked thought amongst um, policymakers. Um, but I might as well just muse a bit about the domestic political context, which, as you're all aware, is, is, uh, is hugely timely for this, uh, for this work. Um, U.S. trade policy is probably approaching something of a turning point. Um, while you know, it's been sort of established that you know, we're not seeing the kind of rise in protectionist legislation that um, some commentary would suggest, we probably are witnessing um, the, you know, the shattering of, of the consensus on trade policy in this country, or at least a weakening of it. Trade and globalization have found themselves on to the political agenda, and they're, they're clearly not going to go away anytime soon. Um, and certainly when you talk to folks on Wall Street, you know, even the most ardent table thumpers about the benefits of trade are at least privately conceding that there needs to be a new discourse in the same way uh, that Milton Friedman's comments no longer travel far enough and companies have begun to embrace corporate social responsibility. They also want to develop similar ways of thinking and, and similar rhetoric um, around the issues of trade. Um, even, uh, again, the most stalwart uh, Republicans on the Hill who have been resistant to the inclusion of enforceable international labor rights and trade policy have not only conceded that vis-a-vis -vis the pending agreements, but you know, as, as some of us in the room here heard at a recent uh, session, um, have agreed that that's probably going to permanently become part of, of U.S. trade policy. Um, this book's relevant to all of those people. Um, it's also highly relevant to Democrats. We heard from Baucus a couple of days ago um, saying that there needed to be a new consensus on trade. He went on to say that Democrats needed to reclaim their internationalist legacy. Um, but the speech probably, I think, well, I'm sure he wouldn't concede it, but many observers would say was, was a bit light on, on substance. Um, there isn't a lot of, of sort of strong, compelling, commonly accepted ideas at the moment uh, about how to address those, those concerns. Um, and we're seeing that on the campaign, tra campaign trail as well, you know, particularly amongst Democratic presidential candidates who are picking up on a populist message and, and just and echoing it back to, to many voters in a way that's you know, working for them well on the campaign trail, but probably won't work so well for whomever either party finds themselves in the White House. They're going to be quickly searching around for real ideas, practical ideas, constructive ways in which to address these issues comprehensively um, and, and, and begin, begin to develop a, a new working uh, trade agenda. And this is clearly where, where this book comes in. So if, if I had a question, it would, I, uh, I'll invite all of you to, to ask questions in a moment as well. Um, it would probably be about how, um, how uh, Susan and Jamie feel or expect this book to be received domestically, how, how it will be received on the Hill, um, and also how you think it will be received in, in the sort of post-election environment and whether it will have an influence and whether you've had any positive feedback. Um, I'll leave that question hanging for a moment. We can come to it if there's a pause. Um, but I'll, I'll first of all invite uh, anyone who'd like to to ask a question. I'd like you to stand and state the name of your organization uh, as well as give us your question. So who wants to go first? At the back with the beard. Hey, Ethan, you may not know this, but the author of that book is sitting, I believe, right next to you. There she is, Carol Peer. You're not Carol Peer? Oh, okay. You sure look like her. See how long it's Philip died. I didn't even know that. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> it's very interesting in terms of how the National Labor Relations Board has basically ceased to enforce the law. And the U.S. is one of the few countries, you know, industrial democracy, that are labor code. And you, know, you walk into work and you're fired the next day. I mean, upon your arrival, whereas mm -hmm. France and Germany, et cetera, that's impermissible. And I'm wondering if we sort of look at labor code and things like that. Well, we we did look at labor conditions in the United States, and um, actually, um, Carol Pira, I sorry, I, you look like her, but my eyes aren't so good this far away, so I apologize to you. Um, she was one of our advisors. Oh, okay. Oh, you didn't? I thought you did. Sorry. I'm not Oh, okay. But you wrote the big report on it. Yeah, for Human Rights Watch. Okay. I thought that was the book was your report. Okay. Um, so Carol would be better positioned to answer this question, but in fact our advisors kind of, um, we, we did do a lot on domestic labor rights situation, but in the end, um, you know, um, it, this is a trade policy problem. <coughs> I, I'm of the school, Jamie may disagree, that labor rights in the United States are to a great extent declining because of a multitude of factors including a commitment on the part of government to enforce, declining cloud of unions. But globalization is playing a part in that, no doubt about it. And it's clear that wages are declining because of global markets for both skilled and unskilled work. The question is, what do you do about it? And do you use, is trade policy the best or only tool to deal with that question? And um, me thinks it is not the best tool to deal with that question, in particular because it has become a debate over protectionism. And I, I just, uh, I personally don't believe that in general protection is the, is the right tool. How do you improve labor conditions and labor standards? And so I don't think that's the right one to go with. But it is something about the hierarchy of human rights. Right. Of course, but the thing is that, you know, the EU um, is, many of the countries of the EU are greatly dependent on Russian oil, and they have to figure out a way to balance their energy needs. Um, and advance the objectives of their foreign policy, of which human rights is very, very high up there. And I, I would say, you know, I can't speak for EU policymakers as I don't play one on TV, but it seems to me that they are struggling to find a way to achieve those goals and find the balance. But is your question, Ethan, where do we view it? Well, where do you view it? Where do you view it? Mm -hmm. say, I don't know, like 10 objectives. For the EU themselves, I mean, I would put that low on their on the list of tools that they use to promote human rights. But what we find interesting is that there it is a tool that they use and increasingly using it and making that more putting that more front and center. But it's definitely not up there. It's not in the top five for sure. Um, but I think that that's. I mean, part of the point of the book is that people don't, when we first sat down with these policymakers and ha did these interviews and we asked them, what do you think about trade policy and human rights and where these two intersect? And they'd say, they don't. They, I mean, that was the initial response almost every single interview, especially with policymakers. But it was explore, it was digging deeper and asking deeper questions where you found, oh, well, there actually were these situations where something did come up and we had to resolve it in this in this certain way very ad hoc nothing no real policy set in place the process isn't set up in a way in which human rights enters easily though increasingly so in the EU but this so I think that the point is that it's coming on to the big picture here and but not that it's within the top 10 even necessarily of ways to promote human rights and then it, and it varies as well with 
who the trade partner is. I think the EU is more willing to use human rights clauses in certain in certain agreements and certain conditions, but then, you know, depending on the trade partner that they're working with, they might shy away, and I think that's all, in my opinion, a very political move. And context really matters, too. The debate over access to health care in the United States has not been, and except for in terms of imported medicines, a debate about human rights, <laughs> right? But I think that's changing. You know, as policymakers recognize that some of the decisions that they made in terms of the Australia Free Trade Agreement and, and how gov governments go about purchasing drugs for their citizens in those states that guarantee the right to health and access to affordable medicines for their people, um, that those policy decisions not only affected people in Australia, but also people in the United States. That debate is changing. So I think you have to look at context a lot of times. And I think Owen made that point. You know, just now, the debate over trade is changing. And if we are savvy and good marketers, we can inject these questions into that debate beyond where it is right now, which is about labor rights or it's about sanctions to Myanmar. But it's about so much more than that, too. I think it's too broad and, and also detailed uh, answers to the questions. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Wolfgang Schaefer of Georgia International. I think this is a very fascinating subject. Thank you for all the work you've done. It sounds like <clears throat> what you did is like do an assessment of who applies trade as a means to promote uh, human rights. What I think is most interesting, I was wondering whether you were able to address it in that book, is to what extent has any of these trade sanctions or at least trade negotiations been actually effective in promoting human rights. I mean, we're talking about Myanmar. Question is, well, whatever is going to be done, is it going to be effective? And who's going to be hit by it, obviously? Do you hit the, the total population, and that's what you really don't want to do, or do you just hit the rulers responsible for the situation? And how do you do this? And what is the history of success, really, in promoting the goals with the means you're employing? Well, um, that's, that's, again, if we're talking about human rights in general, again, the 30 human rights under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, trade itself, both empirically and anecdotal, the more trade, I mean, who would think that I would be saying this, but I am, um, uh, seems to encourage more human rights over time because I mean, this is, what, this is what the lobbyists said during the China NTR hearing. And I felt like a fool for buying into it. But the evidence is for many human rights, more trade does lead to greater, more openness does lead to greater interchange, which over time leads to uh, greater rights. No one can look me in the eye and say that the people of China don't have more human rights now, and trade had a lot to do with this, as well as the government's willing to invest in those people and provide them more with access to health care and increasingly to moving about that country. But that country is so far from a human rights paragon, it's unbelievable. Should we, should we stop trade then? Is, for example, the Olympics which would be an example of trade, right? The players come from overseas, from all these different countries. The Chinese people will see it. They'll have an opportunity to interact with the tourists and some of the athletes. That's a good. But on the other hand, do we stop the Olympics and that larger in the interest of punishing China for not doing more in Sudan and Myanmar? And frankly, I don't know. I'd rather us think about the problem differently and think about, are there incentives that we can use? The reason I say this is a friend of mine just testified about the history of sanctions with Sudan and um, you know disinvestment. When you disinvest, you lose all the leverage. And the conventional wisdom is, punish them, disinvest, but then you have no leverage. So I wonder if all the bright people in this room couldn't get their heads together and think about ways that we can provide incentives and those incentives have to be used to tell, let's say, um, Myanmar's policymakers that we're better than the drug dealing and the other things that they do to stay in power to get them to change their behavior. 
I'm not smart enough to come up with that, but maybe collectively we all are. Obviously, the carrot versus the stick is a, an important theme in your thinking, Jamie. Is something you wanted to add, or should we? Um, I would, and I think it's a, a valid point. I, I, it's interesting because depending on, it's so contextual, and what's working and what's not depends largely on the issue that you're talking about in the case at the time. And my own personal opinion is I think trade sanctions are, are ineffective for achieving human rights goals. If that is the end goal, really, I think that that's probably not the best way to go about it. We were positioning ourselves when we wrote this book because we realized this is a controversial topic and depending on the way that you approach it, someone you know might not even want to talk to you about it because uh, they think that you're just coming in waving a human rights flag and that you don't take trade seriously. Um, but, uh, but I think that, you know, it's overall, when you look at these issues all together, I mean, we do highlight different areas with uh, different stories within the book where trade policy, maybe not the sticks necessarily of sanctions, but other sorts of uh, cases where it has been effective. I mean, the case of, the, of TRIPS and the right to health and clarifying that relationship and the amendment at the WTO has been largely effective in providing access to affordable medicines in the developing world, even though that's still controversial, it's still debated, it's still fought in, by, uh, by the U.S. government. But I think there are cases, I think it's, it, it's almost on a case-by-case -case basis whether what's working and what's not. And I think what we're trying to say here is let's look at this bigger picture here and make this more coherent going forward. Adam Cross of the New American Foundation. I think you see a similar process happening in the environmental sphere where everyone becomes more and more aware of global warming and trying to come up with a lot of policy remedies to address it. And a big part of it is, is trying to peg the social cost of continuing to serve our business as usual. So people propose things like carbon taxes, where you, you'd actually have to pay more so that it would cover the, you know, the social, the, the environmental damage that our current standard of living and lifestyle applies. Could you be, has anyone begun to think about a similar regime that you could apply in, in the trade and human rights sphere, like some system of tariffs that say, well, you know, if, you know, if you're, if you're allowing, if you're allowing your workers to, you know, to work in these coal mines and have safety standards, you know, we should pay more for your coal. We're going to assess that the tariff on your coal, and then, and then the idea of, well, if we actually did this, you know, what would it take to bring, you know, the human rights policies of all, of all our trading partners, and including ourselves, up to code? What would be the cost to consumers? I mean, I really, this is. I think this would be a far more complicated exercise when you see global warming, but I think it would be a helpful way to think about, it. and also just you know the idea of, well, if we want to improve, if we really want to get everyone's human rights up to code, what would it cost? The problem is that, you know, I, I think about this a lot because I teach basically CSR, I teach business and public policy, and, and it's a lot easier to teach about environmental problems because people intellectually get it. That sphere is declining. But there's a surplus of people around the world. And you know, you, you know this, globalization makes it easy to tap their skills, and that downward pressure on standards, on people as assets, and yet, intellectually, every policymaker knows if it, he or she wants to grow their country, they have to invest in their people, right? So, I mean, and they see the model of India now, you know, the, the India versus China model, and, and you have to wonder, aren't they thinking along these lines? As more and more, I see, if, go, if countries are brands, you see growing numbers of countries trying to compete on better governance. Um, and even China, to some extent, is trying to ride that. On one hand, it's flailing and it's saying, um, "Where you know, um, don't blame us for these, you know, pro lack of product standards problems." But they're also saying we have to get our house in order at the same time because they know their investment in that country is imperiled if this continues. So it, it is a great dilemma. Um, but um, you know, John Ruggie trying to come up with human rights standards for business. And if that effort succeeds, um, that will be a good. Another thing that may happen is that, you know, there is no binding human rights systems for human rights obligations, but 
I think more and more governments, policymakers, as they think about their people as their greatest assets, are starting to realize we need to do more to promote human rights. But that takes a very sophisticated government. You have to know how to regulate. You have to know when to intervene and when not to intervene. And the United States often gets in people's bedroom. And you know, we've had 200 and however many years of experience as a government. France has, you know, England has had even more. No government's really good at this. Uh, it's going to take a long time, just as it took the Fed, what, to, you know, 1987 to learn how to deal with inflation. It's just going to take governments a long time. At the back. Uh, Thank you. Um, thank you to the guys who are very good Question about the sort of vaccination trade-offs. Um, so I wanted to sort of get your thoughts on this issue because I think there are not all good not all good things go together and there's certain times in which you know there are trade-offs multiple across the country and over time. And you know, go back to the China example, you know, a lot of the growth in, in southern China is told you know hundreds of people in poverty, um, but the uh, workplace you know often involves very limited excellent point and kind of the entire point of the book is that this is incredibly complex and that depending on who you're speaking to or what <coughs> perspective you're coming from uh, where you see advantages and disadvantages vary and trade-offs do exist on all sides and you know our when we focus in on the our recommendations it's how do we how do we look at the entire picture differently in order to see both sides when we debate it and not just one or the other. I, and I think, I mean, I, the spatial trade-offs that you mentioned, I, that's something we do discuss a bit in the book when we discuss um, labor rights in South Africa and what has happened to their textiles industry as a result of the end of the African Growth and Opportunities Act and uh, its competition with China. And, the, and this is a question that I'm asked a lot about, well, you know, these preferential agreements, you know, if you're, you know, you say, well, you're, and from your point of view, you're saying, if you give the preferential agreement to countries in Africa to improve the welfare of those citizens and what's happening to people in Asia who aren't getting the same preferential treatment, the question that I'm usually asked is, what happens to all these poor people in Africa when you stop giving them this preferential treatment and then, they're, and then the competition is even greater against them and on in India and China. And so it's I think I mean there I don't have any any real answers to this other than just laying what we did is lay this out on the table. But I think that you're absolutely right, you make a really good point. And I hope that the World Bank and especially the development economics research group there is could start looking at this with all those bright minds and actually find out some of the answers to these questions. Um, you know, Varun, thank you very much for your question. And it leads to something that was a real big dilemma for Jamie and I in doing this work, which is that is there a hierarchy of human rights? Are there some human rights that are just more important than others? And I don't know if that's culturally determined or 
and I don't know what to do about it, frankly. But I think about it a lot as a mom, and also as someone watching what's happening in Iraq, where you know, one person says, oh, but they have the freedom to vote. And another person says, they have no freedom from fear. They, you know, every day a mother wants, will I be killed, will my child be killed, will, you know. So what, what matters more, personal security or the right to vote? And we don't think about it in those ways. And it's anathema in the human rights community to think about it in those ways. And, but I, I think that we need to think about it. Actually, I wanted to sort of jump in with one question. Um, it's actually sort of somewhat following up on the very first question that was brought up. And in your talking to people, you know, especially in, in Europe and in the United States, did you come across any sort of growing or any awareness or you know, growing awareness that there may be a new dynamic at play? I mean, sort of, you know, that re that these trade relationships, which we have really seen as a way of sort of exporting liberalism and exporting stability, that maybe we're at some way at a tipping point now and that they have become a pathway for the importation of authoritarianism and the importation of instability. And in mean, the case with, you know, Putin and the, uh, um, that, or the, the Russians and the, um, the Chechnya, um, uh, you know, example is, is one, but also, I mean, you see it now with sovereign wealth funds, you know, and, and th these are the, you know, the idea that China is going to be using its capital to invest in U.S. companies, you know. So this, I'm just wondering if there's an awareness of that with, that you came across. I would say definitely in Europe. Would you say in South Africa? Mm -hmm. from the from the developing country context, I mean, they they more see, saw themselves as this whole you know, a group of 22 band of brothers are coming together to to insert their own uh, agenda into uh, more forcefully into uh, the international trade system and into the big players that have basically dominated this for some time. It, it's a little bit different of a question than how the U.S. and the EU uh, perceive it, but. I, I, I kind of see it, what you hear from less so policy makers, but I heard it more from politicians in the EU, because um, I happened to go to an EU conference where a lot of legislators were at. And what they said, they didn't say it explicitly, but th this is a problem of inadequate governance. What we're dealing with is trade problems are more and more about the problems between nations that do have good systems of governance and nations that are unwilling or unable or because they're corrupt, do not enforce the rule of law. And so the way that you phrased it is excellent. And I think that that may be. There was this debate when the ITO was first developed before the GATT. As Czechos and then when the GATT started happening and the ITO was abandoned, Czechoslovakia went from being a democracy to being communist. And the United States wanted to kick out Czechoslovakia. And we talk about this in the book because it was no longer what the club was supposed to be, which was Club of Free Market Democracies that the GATT was supposed to include. The Europeans said no, because this is a means by which we can keep Czechoslovakia at least in the right direction. Who knows who is right? So we've got a question back. Uh, well, in 
the negative impact of subsidies in the developed countries on developing or the negative impact of subsidies in general? Well, I'm especially concerned about the developed uh, index on, on developing countries, let's say in general. Mm -hmm. Well, that. It's, yeah, we do, we do talk about it in the book. We talk about it um, primarily in the context of the WTO negotiations um, and a bit in the EU chapter and we talk about their agricultural policy. Um, didn't, didn't go into it much in the United States because we were already tackling the issue in a similar case um, in the EU. Uh, but we didn't look at that necessarily for Brazil or South Africa for the ag for agricultural subsidies, but we find it is a hugely relevant issue. We think it's something, and I think when we were discussing which issues to include after all of these interviews, and, and when we would ask, where do you see this relationship between human rights and trade? Of course, this is one, particularly in the developing world, that comes up every single time, and it's it is very important. I have my own personal opinions on on this as a international development person, um, but uh, but because this topic has been it's been pretty saturated and, and, and debated for a long time. We decided to focus on maybe some of the other issue areas that were a little more uh, new and, uh, and, 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 uh, and, thought it, and not thought about in necessarily those terms. So we do, we do discuss it. We think it's an, it's an important issue. The debate's going to go on on it. Um, but I don't know, are you looking for a particular opinion on it or just whether it's, whether it's written in the book? We do, we do discuss it and we just, in, in the EU chapter especially, the, the sort of irony between their really progressive stance on human rights and putting human rights clauses and doing human rights impacts assessments uh, for their trade agreements, but then holding fast on this issue of subsidies um, for their agricultural goods. And it goes back to the questions on labor rights and, and the trade-offs one versus the other, protecting labor rights at home versus labor rights abroad, or looking at this, not only looking at the human rights of the people within your own borders, but in the global context and the issues of food security. All these things are touched upon. It's definitely one of the most controversial issue, trade issues now, so good question. There's a question in the front row, so I'm trying to get in. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Uh, my name is Gerald McSwiggin. I'm with the Business Center Leadership Center. And Susan, you you talked a little bit. You just mentioned the role of individual businesses, and I wondered if you could just expand upon that a little bit. If, if you looked at it, it, you know, in the book. And, oh and, yeah. Um, you know, well, the, the this book came out of work that I did on corporate social responsibility and corporate social responsibility in China, <laughs> and um, just my frustration with the notion, of course, of social responsibility, because it's really not the job of firms to enforce the rule of law or to provide public goods, but increasingly they are asked to do so in countries like Tanzania and Guatemala. And so what should one do about that? And I think governments such as the United States and Norway and Korea have a responsibility to say to their firms, thou shalt do one's best to not only adhere to local law, but to adhere to international law and to adhere to the expectations of your stakeholders, and that includes, let's say, your home country stakeholders. And um, it was clear that guidance on human rights was quite unclear. What role did trade play in that? What role did investment agreements play in that? And so after flailing around for, for a bit with this, you know, I, I, I went back to trade, because my previous books have been on trade. Did that answer? Okay, so I mean, so you think that um, sort of the broader, poli broader policy of trade in general has more of an effect on the I think investment agreements are really where the problem is, but that's a totally different subject, and I'm, I'm not the babe to tackle it. Uh, but in fact, um, John Ruggie, I, you might want to come to the book party at the bank on Tuesday because I think John Ruggie will be talking about, you know, the bank funded his research on investment agreements and their role in human rights. And I think there's some pretty dismaying findings. Um, I, the, you know, many, many NGOs have long alleged that these investment agreements, investor state provisions, undermine the ability of states to regulate and to protect their people from environmental or social harm. And so 
you know, the IFC actually paid for its staff to look into those questions and not looking pretty. Okay, we'll take a final question. Uh, Keith Henderson, American University. Uh, very interesting, but I'm uh, wondering if you could uh, tell us from all of your interviews with uh, all the dozens or hundreds of people <laughs> you talked to, um, where you think uh, trade agreements or WTO has had the most impact on human rights? Of the 30 human rights, which, which ones which are you able to tell us now? Um, you know, have, you know, where there's been some impact. You mean positive impact? Positive impact. Well, one that, you know, is a shocker <laughs> as a non-lawyer is due process rights, political participation. I just said in this regard, you know, people oppose the Oman, Bahrain free trade agreements, but the WTO, a, a very smart woman named Sylvia Ostry was telling us about, and a and guy named Steve Charnovitz, a law professor at GW, has done considerable work in this regard about how WTO rules have actually allow for public comment, the governments are forced to put in place mechanisms, they have to, you know, post these things, make them transparent, so it forces them to learn how to govern in the way that democracy's view is acceptable. And then the spillover, and we tested for that, so thus they encourage political participation to some extent. And then there is binding regulation. You know, this WTO system has a system of dispute settlement. So if you don't enforce your intellectual property laws, you can be challenged. And that that leverage, if you will, has led to enforcement. But is it enforcement of the priorities that many people would like to see, the human rights priorities? Would you call that rule of law uh, enforcement? You know, if you're trying to match up and where the impact has hit these 30 specific rights and universal declaration. It's both positive and negative in yeah. surprising ways. And the one human right may advance at the same time others decline. Mm -hmm. um, so just to clarify, in your interviews, though, did you ask everybody this question? You know, if you look at these 30 rights, you know, where has trade or WTO had the most impact? I mean, do you have a... No, we didn't answer. No, it, wasn't, it wasn't a checklist of, <laughs> okay. of mark here which rights you think have been impacted uh -huh. or not. It's it was more where have you seen this happen? What do you think about about trade and human rights and 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 approaching it more from that point of view. But interestingly, you know, it, the interviews would reflect the human rights ethos of that of that country and that we that. Know, where the U.S. or the EU thinks that human that trade policy or trade agreements are making the most impact is coming from a completely different place, a completely different mindset than, the, than South Africa and Brazil, who th who are looking at trade. You know how how can trade policy be used to to advance our human rights, or how can trade po how has trade policy made it more difficult for us to uphold certain protect certain human rights? Whereas in the EU and the in the US, the stories they would say, well, well, look at how we're going out and helping the world with their human rights. So it's all it's all very, yeah, it, it's coming from the his the, their own human rights and political histories of. But those you would nations. say there's a consensus among all those you interviewed that WTO has promoted human rights. Oh no, just no. the opposite. Not a consensus. No, there's okay. not a consensus on anything in this. Okay. <laughs> we can talk further afterwards. Okay. So, yeah, I think thank everybody you. Has to okay. Go. On that point, thank you very, all very much for coming. And uh, yeah, I think you can also uh, join the authors at the World Bank uh, on Tuesday at noon uh, in Auditorium J1 if you want to chat more casually with them as well.